Mm -hmm. Also, we have to put uh, non-negative constraints. And then we uh, minimize the Lagrange function in the inner level. We minimize the Lagrange function with respect to the W, right? The feature weak vector and Bob's parameter and slab variables, right? And how, how can we solve the inner minimization? Simply take the gradient, right? This is, this is take, taking gradient and set, set them to be zero. Our kind of universal approach, right? Mm -hmm. No matter if you are doing maximization, minimization, even max min or min max. As soon as your, your function is a uh, uh, differentiable, just take gradient, right? And you, you, you just take gradient uh, with respect to WP and uh, select variables and set them to be zero. We, uh, we solve those equalities, we derive a, a set of results, right? Mm -hmm. And then we uh, substitute these results into the original Lagrange function. We can simplify the inner minimization problem, right? We, because we, we directly replace it with the optimal value. And then we turn it into a, a single maximization problem, right? So if you still remember, it is kind of a form like this. And uh, uh, the outside is about the Lagrange mathematics, <coughs> uh, which must be non negative. Uh, and also, uh, an outside, which is a uh, uh, quadratic function, right? So we have a double submission and a double submission. Each double submission term is alpha i, alpha g. This is a quadratic, right? Because alpha i times alpha g and times labels y, i, y, g. And uh, there is an interesting thought product here, right? x i transpose x g, right? And then plus, yeah, come on, you, you should you should memorize this formula. I won't give you this formula. Summation of the Lagrange mass product, right? Mm -hmm. And also because uh, uh, when we solve the inner minimization problem, uh, uh, when we set the gradient with respect to box parameter B and uh, the slab variables to be zero, we obtain two additional constraints, right? One constraint is that the summation of each of i by i is uh, Zero, right? A second, some, the second constraint is that alpha i plus beta i is uh, c, right? C is a hyperparameter of our primal formulation, right? And here, of course, uh, the Lagrange multipliers for beta must be non negative, right? And now, and then because beta i does not appear in objective function, and it only appears in a constraint function, we can simply remove beta i by constraint alpha i to be less than or equal to c, right? And then we turn a maximization problem into uh, minimizing the negative uh, objective function. And finally, our new problem becomes what? A quadratic, a constrained quadratic minimization problem, right? Mm -hmm. So, which is simply minimize uh, this negative objective function. We put, uh, we put minus sign in front of it, right? So you got a uh, double summation here. Uh, something here, alpha i, alpha g, and y, i, y, g, x, i, transpose x, g, right? This is a still dot product here, right? And now we have an empty sign here over the summation of alpha i, but our but the constraint becomes uh, for each alpha i, we have a, it must be between 0 and C, right? Mm -hmm. And also we have an a extra constraint that the uh, summation of productions between our, each alpha i, y, i is uh, 0, right? And this is a pretty uh, standard form uh, for uh, for quadratic optimization. And this uh, uh, you can use any you can use any standard complex optimization package to solve this problem. It's pretty uh, it's pretty mature. The algorithm are pretty mature, right? And then we can obtain the optimal the solution, which is the optimal Lagrange multiplier, right? Remember, in this simplified uh, uh, minimization problem, the only interesting variables are alpha i's, the, la the Lagrange multipliers. Then we just solve this, and all, all the constraints are about to the Lagrange multipliers, alpha i's, right? And then we solve it, we got a set of optimal Lagrange multipliers. Okay? And then the question becomes, how can we use these uh, optimal Lagrange multipliers to recover our primal solution? That, that means what is the optimal heat vector and what is the optimal bus parameter, right? This is a 
the solution from private problem. Because from the private problem, we want to estimate a linear classifier, right? Which determines by, which is determined by the weak vector plus prime. Then how can we recover it? KKT conditions? Yeah, let, let's first look at how to recover the, the optimal weak vector. Is it the sum of alpha i and y i's? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. correct, correct. Perfect. When we solve the uh, dual form, right, when we use a step-by-step -step approach, we fix all side level. We solve the min uh, in a minimization level, we take the gradient uh, with respect to W and set it to be zero. What can we get? We get a very interesting mm -hmm. solution that W is always the uh, linear combination, right? Linear combination of uh, the production between each y i and x i, right? Between the input and weighted by the language multiplier alpha i, right? So now that we have the uh, optimal alpha i's, right? Then to obtain the optimal b vector w, we we'll just uh, substitute the optimal alpha i's into that. We got our optimal b vector. Very easy, right? Very straightforward. So our optimal b vector can be calculated from the uh, dual solution by the summation, right? Alpha i star, and also production between y i and x i. Right? And how can we <coughs> how can we recover the optimal bus from the b? That one's from the KKT conditions, correct? Yeah. Why we we should look for look, look at KKT conditions because when you solve the dual form. When you minimize the, uh, the Lagrange function in the inner level, even you set the, bus, uh, the gradient with respect to b to be zero, you cannot find any clue to compute b explicitly. Right? And then to solve this problem, we uh, introduce uh, a very important uh, concept called KKD condition. Right? It takes a central role in constraint optimization problem, right? not only in convex optimization, also in the non convex optimization. And then we use the KDD conditions to analyze our solutions. So what kind of KDD conditions we use? Remember, KDD conditions actually <coughs> about four types of conditions. So what kind of conditions did we use? Complementary slackness. Yeah, complementary slackness, right? It's very interesting. It is a very interesting um, condition, right? It means that for so suppose we are, we, are, we, are, we are solving a general constraint optimization problem. We have a multiplier uh, lambda i, right? <coughs> we have a corresponding constraint function j x, right? Then the complementary slackness says that when we have the optimal parameters for lambda i and, and also the uh, interesting variable x, then their production must be zero. This condition implies that either the optimal Lagrange multiplier or the constraint function at the optimal x is zero. Or they can, they can both be zero. That's fine. Right? Then we actually use uh, the slackness, uh, the, the complementary slackness, and also the constraint we obtain from uh, solving dual form together to analyze uh, how to calculate the optimal bus prime, prime B, right? It's quite a, it's a, it's a it's kind of lengthy uh, uh, reasoning process, but it's quite simple. Right? You can check out the slides. But generally, what is, what is the way to compute the optimal bus parameter? Can you report? So basically, to convenience solve an optimal B, we can look for a set of uh, training examples, right? Which satisfy some uh, special conditions. What kind of training examples do we need to look for? Uh -huh. Just the ones inside of the margin, correct? Or like within the slackness? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. I want to sum. Um, I think 
for inside margin output is scaling for outside margin output is zero. But those are the ones we want. Yeah. We just uh, need to look at uh, a small set of training examples, right? Say a small training example whose uh, say a training example G, if its corresponding optimal multiplier after G star is a strictly between zero and C, what will happen? We can use the complementary slackness and uh, other, other the condition that alpha i star, alpha g star plus beta g star must be C. And we use the, those conditions together, we can derive that the function margin for xg, well, this is the function margin, which is uh, yg times the classification function, right? xg plus b equals to 1. If, uh, if, you, if you cannot uh, recall how we arrive at this solution, uh, I, I suggest you to uh, look for the slides. Right? You need to understand uh, the, the whole procedure. But that just uh, means uh, uh, that just uh, made details and let me give you the results, right? So as long as we can find out a uh, training example J who is optimal, like when multiplier is strictly between zero and C, then we can conclude that the function margin of the X G and Y G is simply one. And because we have already obtained the optimal v vector, right? And then we, to obtain the optimal last parameter b, we can simply solve this equation. And if you, if you have multiple uh, training examples who satisfy this result, namely their corresponding optimal Lagrange multipliers are strictly between 0 and c, then for each example, we can calculate one optimal last parameter, right? And for robustness, we can simply average them. So although theoretically speaking, they should be exactly the same. <coughs> yeah, that's a, generally, the, 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 the strategy is for us to recover the optimal B vacuum bus parameter from the dual solutions. And then we look into the form of the optimal B vacuum. So we, as we have already noticed that the optimal B-vector is a, a linear combination, right? Linear combination of uh, the multipliers uh, times the training input and uh, times the label, right? This is very interesting. And from the slackness complete, uh, from the complementary slackness, we know that many alpha i, alpha i's are simply zero. What does it mean? If for some training example i is uh, optimal alpha i is zero, what does it mean? It means that the, X, the sample x i, y i, will have nothing to do with optimal weak vector, right? In other words, the optimal weak vector is uh, solely determined by a set of training examples whose optimal alpha i's are non-zero. And we'll give a name of those kind of uh, training examples. What is that name? Support vectors, right? That's uh, how support vectors is uh, from. And then we'll, then we'll analyze the, what, what the locations or the position of support vectors, right? Where do the support vectors locate? So for, for any training example, if, if it is a support vector, namely means that, namely, the optimal Lagrange multiplier must be a positive, right? Then what does it imply? The position of the support vector. Exactly. Yeah, it must be a state on the margin or inside margin. So this is a, this is a very important geometric uh, Conclusion about support vectors. Say, if, I'm, if, if this is our hyperplane and uh, this is our margin, and uh, we have a lot of uh, positive examples, negative examples outside margin, and only a few train examples are stay on margin or inside margin, support vectors are only possible those 
clean examples which break into the margin, stay on the margin. And unfortunately, for the majority of training examples which stay outside the margin, their corresponding multipliers must be zero. We have shown you this point. We have shown you this point. We have proved that. That's why we often say the solution of support vector machines are sparse. Why? Because uh, optimal V vector is only determined by a relatively much smaller number of training examples, right? rather than the entire training one. Because most of the training examples whose optimal average multiplier is simply zero. Yeah. These are all about the dual form and dual solutions, also support, vector, support vectors. And then to uh, extend our support vector machines for a nonlinear classification problem, we introduce the concept of kernels. So how can we motivate kernels or kernel functions?
to calculate the adult product, you have to use a, you have to store two one million by one feature vectors, right? And then you calculate the inner product of two one million by one feature vectors. This cost it. Then that motivates us to think of a, a function. Right? A function k, which is a, which has two inputs. Right? One input is an x, and the other input is z. Right? I want to find a simple way to calculate this function that is only operating x and z in the original feature space, low dimensional feature space. But actually, the result is totally equivalent to. Uh, the dot product uh, after explicit feature mapping, right? This is the idea of a current tree, right? And in the last lecture, we have uh, shown uh, such an example, right? So this uh, feature mapping is called a uh, polynomial feature mapping, right? We we uh, we uh, extend we 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 map our original feature vector. Uh, into a higher dimensional space by expanding all the quadratic uh, terms and uh, combinations between their features, right? And we have shown that this dimension of mapped feature vectors is uh, proportional to n squared if we already don't have n features. So if we do a, if we perform the explicit feature mapping and uh, dot product after the feature mapping, both the competition cost and storage cost will be uh, proportional to n squared, right? And then we discuss another simpler kernel function. Right? We can calculate a kernel function like this, which is simply 1 plus the inner product in x and z, and take the square. Right? This calculation only has a, a open computational complexity, right? because it is performed in an original feature space. In our original feature space, x and z are both n-dimensional. Right? And their inner product is simply O n. And then you uh, plus one take square is just the scalar. Then I'm showing that uh, as two dimensional input as an example, we have shown that actually uh, calculating the explicit uh, feature mapping and dot product uh, is uh, equivalent to calculate this uh, simple kernel function. Except the few differences in the uh, you know in the in the in the like, you know, constants in the in the summation terms, right? But that doesn't that doesn't matter because we're trying to learn a linear classifier. Right? The weight vector can um, can offset this uh, effect. So in this example, we can see the power of current trip. So current trip basically wants to use a current function to replace the explicit feature mapping in the very high dimensional space and calculate the explicit explicit the dot product. This is called a current trip. I hope, I hope you, you, are, you are not lost here. I'm not going to calculate this once again. Right? You, can, you can calculate it again. Uh, it's, it's very easy to show that the, 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 the results for the two, two computations are almost the same. So here's the definition. Here's the formal definition of current trick. So basically, we want to compute the dot product after mapping x and z into some uh, very high dimensional and uh, perhaps uh, infinite dimensional feature space. And to save the completion, we want to uh, come up, we want to use uh, a kernel function, Kx, which only perform, performs operations in original feature space without any explicit feature transformation or mapping. In this way, we can dramatically save time and space. That's, that's called kernel trick. So we can say, by applying kernel trick, what kind of thing do we have? So for the degree two polynomial feature transformation example, right, as we just reviewed, if we perform explicit uh, dot product after feature mapping, then both time complexity and space complexity will be <coughs> one plus n plus this uh, n square term. This is actually an uh, accurate term. I, I, just, uh, I, just, uh, I just consider it as uh, uh, O n squared. But if you use our kernel function, as we just uh, listed 1 plus x transpose z and then take square, then your time and space complexity is just uh, open, which is in the original feature space.
So these are our kernels and kernel tricks. Very simple. Simply, it's just a conditional tree. Then the problem is that to perform kernel trick to see our condition, can we use any function of two input vectors? Can we? Say, can, can I use a, a function like uh, uh, kxz equals to x minus z and uh, take the norm? Can this function be, uh, is this function a kernel function, a value of kernel function? Or, or let me randomly write down another function like uh, kxz is equal to uh, like uh, 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 norm of x plus norm of z. Is this a valid kernel function? The answer is no. Why? Because the function k of two input vectors, right, x and z, is valid only if it really corresponds to uh, the dot product of two map feature vector, right? If it does not correspond to such kind of feature mapping, then it is meaningless, right? It's meaningless to compute it. Remember, our, our, we want to incorporate the uh, kernel function. It's just to replace the explicit dot product after some high dimensional feature mapping, right? But now, if your function itself does not have any corresponding feature mapping and dot product condition, then what's the meaning for us to calculate the, the function? So obviously, to choose a valid kernel function, we need to check. We need to check whether it is valid, whether it, it really corresponds to uh, some nonlinear feature mapping and uh, the associated dot product. Mm -hmm. So when you say it corresponds to, like you mean it approximates? No, that's not approximate. It must correspond to uh, some exact feature mapping and then perform dot product. This is called valid kernel function. The way we figure out if this exact feature mapping, uh, we see if they have the same dimension. dimension. Not only the same dimension. Not only, it's also I also correspond to how you what's the definition of each map feature, each map feature, right? You know, you know, very high dimensional feature vector. What about each element? Each element in the map feature vector must be uh, some uh, composition of the original features of feature vector. If you want to decide to use some uh, function of two input vectors x and z, you must you must make sure that it corresponds to some uh, dot product of the feature matrix. So I thought we said it could be close, though. So you're saying it has to be exact? Yeah, it has to be exact. Okay. Except the, the coefficients can be different, but the like in the case of the degree two, it's like there has to be an x1, x2 term in the next. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, you said, okay, it is uh, very close to some uh, feature mapping, right? Only difference is in a uh, coefficient. Right? But actually, when you manipulate the coefficients, it can correspond to another feature mapping. Okay. Yeah. Right. I just want to show you the resemblance of computation, com computing this explicit dot product and that's the other one. But, uh, but uh, if, you, if you want to convert, the kernel function, the example we shown before, of course you can, you can convert it into the dot product between two explicit feature mapping. And the question is about the understanding of the kernel trick. Okay. And then how can we justify a function as a kernel function? And here I give you a general condition. So uh, to introduce the general condition, let us introduce the concept of graph matrix. So basically, graph matrix uh, is defined on a set of input vectors, and uh, and uh, we need to check whether the kernel matrix will correspond to graph matrix, which is positive semi-definite. So specifically, let us first look at uh, let us first uh, recall what is the property of semi the positive semi-definite. What is positive semi-definite? And who here only consider symmetric matrices. Right? So basically from the linear algebra of the uh, 
definition of the, the positive sign definite matrix is, is as follows. So we say a symmetric matrix M is positive semi definite if for any non zero vector, this quadratic term, Z transpose MZ, this is a scalar, it is non negative. Remember, this is a scalar vector. And positive semi definite is very useful property, which characterizes many, many mathematical objects, not only in uh, this um, kernel matrix, kernel functions. And then let us look at the definition for grand matrix and kernel matrix. So the grand matrix is defined on a final set of uh, vectors. Say, if we have a set of n vectors, x1 and xn, then we can form an n by n grand matrix. And each element is a dot product between two vectors in the set. Say, the IG's entry of G is simply a dot product between X and XG. This is called grand matrix. And of course, this definition is uh, valid even if you perform some uh, nonlinear feature matching, right? Suppose we have a, a feature matching fig, right? And then we have, after we, after feature matching, our left feature vectors will be phi x1, phi x2 to phi xn. Then we can also define our grand matrix on this left feature vectors. So question, does the size of the, uh, is the size of grand matrix uh, determined by the dimension of the input vectors. Why? It's determined by how many there are. What? It's, it's determined by how many there are. Yeah. It determined by the size of the uh, data, right? It determines the number of input vectors in your set. That actually has nothing to do with the dimension of the x1. So after feature mapping, your vx1 to vx1 could be a even infinite dimension, right? But they assume that after the dot product, phi x1 transpose phi xj is still finite. Then our grand matrix is always at n by n. The next question is how can we show that grand matrix is positive sign that? So consider we have a, 
a non-zero vector z, right? We want to verify whether the quadratic form z transpose gz is an empty. We know that g is simply x, x transpose. Now we we'll replace g by this uh, form. We got uh, z transpose gz is z transpose uh, x, x transpose z. How can we conclude from this form? What can we conclude from this form? X transpose z is a vector, right? Remember z is a vector, right? X is matrix, matrix multiplied by a vector is a vector, right? And then z transpose x is what? So let us denote v equals to x transpose z, right? The z transpose x is what? It's just v transpose, right? And then x transpose z is v, right? So this quadratic form is simply v transpose v. What does v transpose v mean? It is the square norm of v, right? So the square norm of v is always a non empty, right? Let me show that. Actually, for any non-zero vector, z transpose g z is uh, <laughs> non empty, right? So the grand matrix is always a uh, positive sign that way. So this is the important property for a uh, grand matrix. The net, now let us uh, uh, look at how can we show a function k is a uh, a valid kernel. So the first way is quite straightforward. It's called direct approach. Simply, you just show. You can just find out uh, an explicit efficient line. You show that your kernel, your function k of x z is simply the dot product between phi x and phi x and phi z. Then it's done. Actually, we have, we have find out some feature mapping for. The previous example, right? the previous function, one plus x transpose z to the square, right? We have shown that we have shown we have shown it is equal to some phi theta x transpose phi theta z, right? Now that we have find out such feature mapping and ensure that the dot product of feature mapping is exactly this function value, then we have finished the, the proof that this function is a valid current function. This is called direct approach. But this is often invisible because uh, the kernel function could be uh, uh, very complex. This is not that obvious to find out an explicit map feature mapping which is equivalent to the kernel function. Then how can we justify our kernel value? That comes to the second approach called the indirect approach. That is. We simply write down the kernel matrix for any final set of um, input vectors. So what is the kernel matrix? For kernel matrix, we also have a set of uh, input vectors, right? And then we also have a like grand matrix. We also have a, a k n by n matrix, right? But each entry k i j is simply a function of k x i k x j k x i x j. Then we just check whether the kernel matrix is a positive sign that matrix, which corresponds to grand matrix. So here is the detailed uh, theorem. It's called Mercer's condition. So let k and x and z to be uh, a function that maps to uh, n-dimensional feature vectors into a real number, right? And if uh, a k is a valid kernel, if for every final set of uh, input vectors, and then for any choice of real values c1, c2, to the number of the uh, input vectors in our final set, we have this double summation to be non negative. What does this mean? This actually corresponds to the definition of positive set of So don't be uh, scared by this double summation. It's very simple. If you write down the if you if you 
if you use a, a vector C to uh, represent all the real values, C1, C2, blah, blah, to Cn, right? Suppose we have an n input vectors there. And the double summation here is correspond to C transpose K, C, right? K is the n by n kernel matrix. So basically, the, the, the Moser's condition says that if for any final set of uh, training examples, not training examples, input vectors, the corresponding kernel matrix of your function is positive sign magnet, then we can claim the, the, the function is a valid kernel function, and it corresponds to a ground matrix. Any question about this point? So this is, this is uh, the definition of quadratic term, C transpose K, C, right? And this, this matrix is K. Each element of this, K, in this matrix is K is simply, Kij is simply the function Kxi, Xj, right? This function is uh, the function you want to check whether it is a valid kernel. And to verify your, your function is a valid kernel, you just uh, verify for any final set of uh, input vectors this kernel matrix is a positive sign definite or not. If it is always positive sign definite, then it corresponds to that ground matrix, and then it is a valid term. So this is some theoretical results, which is not, which is not very practical. Remember, if you want to, uh, from this theorem, if you want to uh, really prove that a function is a current function, you have to enumerate all possible final set, right? It's actually, in most cases, it is invisible, unless you have some induction method. But this, this is just give you an indirect approach to prove that a current function is valid. But in practice, uh, in practice there are many other ways to construct valid kernels, and we'll discuss uh, data, right? So first, let us uh, look at uh, uh, two commonly used uh, kernel functions. One is called polynomial kernel. So the simplest polynomial kernel is called um, one order polynomial kernel. We say it's just uh, the inner product to x and z here. So this kernel function actually does not map the feature vector. Right? Or in other, in other words, you map the, it, it, it maps the feature vector to itself, to the, to the feature vector itself. And then we can calculate the kernel function uh, to be uh, x transpose z to d. In this way, we map the feature vector into a higher dimensional space. And uh, in the map the feature vector, it contains all d order interactions, each of the elements. If, you, if you're trying to expand this uh, term, you'll find, you'll, find, you'll find an explicit map, feature mapping. You'll find, OK, on each element of the map feature vectors, their total order is D. Obviously, only containing these other interactions might not be enough, and then we can further uh, revise the kernel to be uh, some positive constant C plus this inner product, then, take, uh, then, then to the D. Then, you, if, if, you, if you find out the explicit feature mapping, you'll find, OK, in this new feature mapping, each feature element contains both uh, the other terms and uh, D, D minus one all the terms and D minus two all the terms up to zero all the terms. And you will find that the explicit feature mapping for this current function is actually higher, even higher dimensional than this feature mapping. So this is a polynomial kernel. And another family of uh, commonly used kernel functions is called Gaussian kernel, or really a basis function kernel. It has a very uh, similar, it has very uh, uh, similar form to the uh, Gaussian distribution. So basically, uh, the RBF kernel between x and z is some exponential value. A exponential value to minus the square Euclidean distance between x and z over some constant c. And here c will require c to be uh, positive, and it's a free parameter. And it's very uh, easy to see uh, after the c here determines the, 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 uh, the, the forms or the patterns of the kernel matrix. So if C is very small, and K, the kernel matrix K will be uh, approximately uh, an identity matrix. 
Why? Because uh, in the quantum matrix, the, the diagonal elements uh, is just uh, kxi, kx, kxi, xi, kxj, xt, right? kx1, x1, kx2, x2 to kxn, xn. And from the Gaussian kernel, the square, the Euclidean square distance is simply zero, right? And take exponential is one. And then if for very small c, we can see as long as x and z are different, and then non zero element is divided by a very small value, that could be very large. Then you take a, you, know, you multiply with minus and take exponential, it will be uh, close to zero. Then it means that all dark elements are close to zero. It, it, it is very easy to check. Why everyone looks uh, so confusing? So, so this is a kernel matrix, right? So, what is diagonal element? Kx1, x1, right? Kx2, x2. Until Kxn, xn, right? This diagonal element. So, all diagonal elements is uh, Kx1, x2 to Kx1, xn, right? And here would be Kxn, x1. So basically, for any off diagonal elements, is kxi xg, where i is not equal to g, right? And then for diagonal elements, because this is kxy, x1, x2, x2, the inputs are the same. So the value here is just 1, right? But for off diagonal elements, because xi i is not equal to g, so xi is not equal to xg, then what will happen? Here, the, the, Euclidean, the square Euclidean distance is non zero, right? And if C is very small, a non zero value divided by a very small value could be very large. Then you take an exponential of the negative of that large value, it is close to zero. Means that the all diagonal elements are close to zero. So then we can say, in this case, the kernel matrix is a close to an identity matrix. And similarly, if a if C is very large, what will happen? If C is very large, then it doesn't matter how different is x from z, right? Because uh, any value divided by C is close, close to zero, right? And if you take exponential of zero, it's just uh, one. Right? I mean, uh, if C is very large, then every element in this k could be uh, close, to, close to one. Then k is close to a unit matrix. So I will give you an exercise, and you better to uh, you better try that. Uh, how can you prove this is a kernel using direct approach? Namely, can you find out an explicit feature mapping such that the dot product of the map feature vector is exactly this Gaussian kernel? This is a very interesting problem. Uh, I highly suggest you to uh, um, solve this problem. So. As we just mentioned, direct computation, uh, direct, uh, uh, pr direct proof for kernels are often feasible, right? Because because of complexity of your functions, and indirect proof is uh, also is uh, invisible as well, uh, because you have to check uh, the kernel matrices on any final set of uh, input vectors, right? So both both methods are not very practical. So what are the practical approaches to obtain new kernels, new value kernels? Simple. We just uh, construct new kernels uh, based on the existing value kernels. We have a bunch, a family of the value kernels which we can prove that they are valid. Right? Either use a direct approach or indirect approach. And then we just combine, we make a composition of those uh, existing kernel functions to make a new value kernel functions. So here are a set of rules to construct new kernels. If we multiply the existing kernel value kernel function by the uh, positive constant, then we, we have a, a value kernel. If it multiply with two uh, uh, positive function, then we return, we, we have a new value kernel. Or if uh, plugging the kernel function into a, a polynomial with uh, positive uh, coefficients, we also have a value kernel. Or you take exponential, we also have a value kernel. So there are, uh, also, you can add two kernels together, you get a new kernel function. You multiply them together, you get a new kernel function. 
And also, uh, even uh, if you can plug in the, some explicit feature mapping into the existing kernel, you get a better kernel. And also, you can do some, uh, uh, you can construct your kernel uh, from some symmetric positive sample definitions. By using these rules or combining these rules, you actually can construct uh, very complex kernel functions. And they are guaranteed to be uh, better. This is actually the most common used way to obtain your kernel function. So now we have uh, uh, introduced everything about kernels, kernel trees, and parallels, kernels. And the remaining problem we need to solve is how can we plug in kernel tree into our SVM formulation such that our SVM could be uh, powerful to deal with a nonlinear classification problem? How can we do, it, do that? The K is still in a dual form of SVM. Now you can see how important dual form of, of SVM is. So remember, when we solve the dual form, finally we can uh, manipulate the optimization problem into a constraint minimization problem, a quadratic constraint problem, right? So this is a quadratic term, and the first term is a double summation, right? Inside double summation it is a yi, yg, corresponding to a training example i and training example g, right? Alpha, alpha g is our interesting variables, the Lagrange multipliers, and then we multiply with the dot product between x and xg. And the minus the summation of our rise. And now suppose we want we 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 will have a transform of feature vectors into a very high dimensional space, even infinite dimensional space. Then here the dot product becomes the dot product of the map feature vectors. That is a, a that is a Phi x transpose phi x g, phi x i transpose phi x g, right? This is our mapped feature vectors. And now we, want, we do not want to explicitly compute feature mapping dot product. And what should we do? Using kernel, right? We're just using kernel function to replace this dot product. Then what will be our formulation, objective function? Simply replace this uh, dot product by the kernel function. Then we solve our SVM learning problem by solving this um, convex minimization problem. We have, uh, uh, we have already obtained the nonlinear SVM. <coughs> it's very simple, right? But you need to know why it is valid to replace this dot product by the kernel function. We have first mapped the original feature vector into a higher dimensional space. And in this higher dimensional space, if we want to find out separating hyperplane, then we need to replace the dot product by the dot product of the mapped feature vector. Then we use kernel trick to save the explicit feature mapping. We'll get this kernel function here. In other words, if we solve our, if we learn our support vector machines by Solving this optimization problem, it is equivalent to first transforming our all of our training input vectors to a high dimensional space, and then in that space we find out the separating right? Anyone feel confusing at this point? It's very simple, very straightforward. As long as you, you know everything about SVM, right? and then suppose we have already learned. Uh, remember. When we have a when we have a kernel function here, it doesn't affect the properties of our optimization problem. Because we're trying to find out optimal alpha i's, right? So the kernel function between each uh, training example xi and each training example xj is simply a constant to alpha i and alpha g. Remember we always want to optimize alpha i and alpha g. This, this is a quadratic, this is a quadratic uh, convex optimization problem. So it doesn't affect your Completion complexity of the optimization algorithm. So we can see how kernel trick is so uh, it, it is convenient to help us to uh, convert our linear classifier into a nonlinear classifier. And suppose we have already obtained the optimal alpha x right, by minimizing this uh, objective function. Then how can we do the prediction? 
remember, if you, want, if you want to use two solutions to make prediction, a prediction function will be here, right? And the original, in the original form, is this uh, would be the dot product between x and xg, right? But because we use the kernel function, it corresponds to some uh, feature mapping in high dimensional space. So then we just replace the, the original dot product by this kernel function. That's it. Any questions? Uh, in this uh, here, the kernel fun the two parameter of kernel function is the first one is a vector, the second one is the matrix one. This one x and x. Yes. No, yes, yeah, yeah. This is test vector, right? Yes. We want to we want to we want to uh, classify x to be positive or negative, right? Yes. And x i is the input vector of a training or some training example I right? yeah. So they, 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 are, they, are, they are the feature vectors of the same class. With uh, the x, where is the variable x? I know the x i is uh, input. Uh, x i is the training input vector for I to training example, right? X is test, it's a test input. Okay. We want to test the x to be a positive or negative, right? According to our class form. Any questions? So in this case, we do not use the uh, really decent software with this problem. We use another optimization. <coughs> you can use really decent, but you, do, you have to be careful uh, with the constraints. You can use really decent, but this is another topic about uh, the, another topic about, about the optimization problem, like proxy. Uh, the proximal gradient descent every time we project uh, uh, the gradient of this into a valid region. Of course, we can do that. But this, uh, this is beyond our scope. So, our previous uh, stochastic subgradient me method, remember, it is only for primal solution, right? But the primal solution have, has some limitations. Unless you use explicit feature mapping, you cannot. Uh, you cannot you, 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 you cannot use the kernel trick, right? You cannot perform nonlinear classification because you have to explicitly estimate the weak vector. And even worse, if you some want to come come out some uh, infinite dimensional feature back, then actually it is not feasible to solve it in a primal problem. Because consider that your weak vector is uh, infinite dimensional, because your map feature vector is infinite dimensional. Then you cannot use some stochastic subgradient to optimize the King's loss, blah blah blah. Right? The the only way for us is to uh, to look into the dual form because in dual form we do not explicitly compute the weak vector. Although we can, although of course if we know the feature mapping, we can recover the uh, we can recover the optimal weak vector. Right? But for infinite dimensional feature space, it's not necessary. We only need to have a dot for that. Any questions? So from a linear classifier to nonlinear classifier, for SVM, it's so easy. You just uh, replace the, the original top product, inner product, by a kernel function. That's it. But you must know the whole logic, the whole reasoning process. How can we, how can we achieve this? What's the justification? And interestingly, if we solve this uh, uh, SVM in the nonlinear feature space, uh, what will be the positions of the support vectors? So in the mapped feature space, obviously the support vectors, which correspond to the mapped uh, feature, mapped uh, training feature vectors, right, will still stay on the uh, margin or inside margin, right. But if we project them back to the original feature space, where do they locate? It won't be a, a linear margin. Actually, it's not called margin because margin is only defined for linear classifiers. So we can just, that's why I use quote here, right? So actually, it, uh, it stays on some uh, nonlinear curve, or nonlinear, or we call it nonlinear margin. Right? So here is, I give you an example. So when we perform some uh, nonlinear um, 
learning using Gaussian kernel. So where are the support vectors located? So here, those curves represent uh, uh, the places such that the classification function are the same. You can call it level set or contours, whatever. And those dots, those dots are the support vectors in the original space. But remember, this is just for the original space. We use we apply kernel. Gaussian kernel is actually mapped the original two uh, dimensional feature input into an infinite dimensional feature space. Gaussian kernel is a typical name. Infinite, infinite feature mapping. In an infinite feature map, uh, in, in an infinite Damier feature space, those support vectors are staying on the still staying on the uh, margin or inside margin. But if we come back, if we project them back into the original uh, two-dimensional feature space, this this is their typical locations. So you can see their locations are not like in a line on your hyperplane, right? This is some geometry view of the uh, support vectors in the nonlinear classifiers. So, so up to now we have uh, finished uh, all the uh, everything about the support vectors and support vector machines and current trace. And although uh, we don't have any new homeworks that ask you to implement this uh, uh, interesting nonlinear SDMs, I hope uh, I hope uh, if you have time, you should you should you should you should, you should implement by yourself. It's very easy. Because you only need to solve uh, a uh, quadratic convex optimization problem, use two lines of code, call some, uh, call some optimization package, and then plug in some current function. You'll find very interesting results, and you will be able to draw this plot. So here is a simple summary. Right? So uh, you, should, you should know that what is dual form of SVM, right? It is the dual form of SVM that leads to the concept of support vectors. And uh, use, a dual, use a dual solution to make the final prediction, we only need to compute dot product. That leads to the kernel trick. <coughs> because kernel trick is to uh, replace the explicit dot product after feature mapping by some simple kernel function, right? And, uh, and also, uh, kernel trick is not uh, limited to SVM. Actually, it's, it is widely used. It is actually an independent branch. branch. It is, there is a one um, specific branch of machine learning called kernel, called kernel method. Simply, it's how to use kernels to represent those uh, hidden uh, nonlinear feature mapping, and then to improve our uh, classification performance to deal with uh, more complex uh, learning tasks. Okay, so uh, Then let us use the several minutes to introduce the uh, cross validation. So uh, we know that in uh, in our implementation of SVM, we need to uh, tune some hyperparameter C, right? So where's the best hyperparameter? Actually, it cannot be directly optimized through the objective function. If someone has asked me, right? Why not we directly optimize C as well as the uh, as well as the uh, weak vector and bias parameter? And let's say you can try it. Then they will, you'll get a result C is equal to zero. So actually, you have, you have to fix C. Yeah? Then how can we, how can we find out the best type of line to C yeah, with different applications or in different data set? And then we can generalize this problem into a, a broader context. Say if you want to construct a classifier, and what kind of feature set do we need to use? We need to select a set of features. Which, which set of features are the best? So there are many ways to perform this kind of feature selection or uh, hyperparameter tuning. And here we just introduced uh, a very uh, uh, commonly used approach called cross-validation. So what is cross-validation? Because our training data is just limited, right? We do not have an infinite number of training data. And actually, we do not have an infinite number of testing. That's why we cannot directly get to the test error, right? or the, 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 the generation error. Then we only need, we have to use the training data only to get some approximate, approximate true error to guide our selection of hyperparameter or feature set, right? How can we do that? Very simple, just uh, random shuffle the training example and uh, equally split them into several folds. 
It's called the k-fold cross-validation. So take a five-fold cross-validation as an example. We split whole data set into five parts. And then each time, we uh, fix one part for test. <coughs> and then use the remaining four parts for training. Then we'll get one accuracy. Okay? And then we we'll just uh, uh, do it again and again. We we'll use another, like part four, as a test example. Then use the remaining training examples. Uh, for training, and then test on the part four, on test part, we get another accuracy, right? and then go through all of the folds, and finally we get uh, like k accuracies, right? If it's split data into four k folds, and then we average those accuracies using these accuracies as our test accuracy, the estimate. And similarly, for each specific hyperparameter or specific feature set, we can run this uh, k fold cross validation to obtain a test accuracy, right? And uh, we just, uh, uh, we just uh, test, uh, we just got all the test accuracies for all the candidate hyperparameters. Then finally, we, got, we choose the one with the best k fold test uh, accuracy. That's called uh, k fold cross validation. Uh, this is the most commonly used approach to select uh, the hyperparameters. So I hope, uh, I hope, uh, I hope in your uh, uh, future applications of machine learning. Um, no matter you are using your own packages or you're using your, use your own implementations or use your third party packages, when you choose the best hyperparameters, you will better to use the k fold cross validation. Then suppose we have uh, obtained the best hyperparameter. What should we do? We use this hyperparameter to retrain, to train on the entire data set. Remember, in our original data set, we have uh, split them into, uh, into like k-folds, right? And through this k-fold cross validation, we find the best hyperparameter. Then what's our, our objective of, of choosing the best hyperparameter? Of course, we want to use it to train a classifier, right? And this time, we use the entire training data set. You can, uh, and, 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 and uh, train, train, train this classifier with our best hyperparameter, then we use our result to uh, make the prediction on the future data set. So this is the whole procedure. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's just uh, uh, some practical advice. Um, so up to now, we have finished uh, all the com content we need to discuss. And finally, uh, we are left with several minutes. And, uh, Just want to give you a quick review. So, actually, in the remaining half semester, uh, we discuss uh, two topics. Right. The first topic is uh, uh, computational learning theory. We spent quite a quite a few uh, weeks to discuss uh, the uh, computational learning theory, and then uh, motivated by the computational learning theory results, uh, we introduced support vacuum machines. So of course, our um, the content for the final exam will be will be based on these two topics, obviously. And for computational learning theory, you should know why we like to develop computational learning theory. The motivation, right? What is the general framework? The motivation is to evaluate the performance of a learning algorithm. Um, will these slides be posted online? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And also, what is the framework? Because we have to consider the randomness of training data, then to characterize or to estimate the generation error, we have to use some probabilistic language. That's why all the path learning results or the, complete, uh, the, the sample complexity, those kind of things are described in very lengthy language. Right? Because we have to keep some probabilistic uh, description. Right? With high probability, our true error is less than some level, blah, blah, blah. And we introduced the computational learning theory from uh, two perspectives. perspectives. First, we consider the training error, right? So if your learning algorithm guarantee zero training error, then what kind of learning algorithm? Uh, then, 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 then we call this learning algorithm as uh, consistent learners, right? And what are the uh, path, what, what, are the, what are the learning guarantee we can obtain for consistent learners? And then, 
What if uh, we cannot guarantee your training error is always zero? This is called agnostic learning. Right? And even for agnostic learning, we can still find out uh, uh, a probabilistic guarantee about the error bar. We have shown many examples how to derive the sample complexity, which uh, guarantees the low, the small, true error with high probability. Right? And for agnostic learning, we also show how can you derive a, a bound for the generation error. Right? Remember, the generation error bound will consist of training error because we have a no zero training error guarantee right? with high probability. This is one perspective. Another perspective is from the size of hypothetical space. So uh, for final hypothetical space, we directly show you how to derive the sample complexity impact results, impact learning results. But how about the infinite hypothetical space? Obviously, infinite hypothetical space is more common use. <coughs> what is the key step of turning the sample complexity? That leads to the concept of the path uh, of the of the of the VC dimension, right? You should be very familiar with VC dimension. You should be able to <coughs> compute VC dimension for simple hypothetical spaces, right? And also, uh, important concepts include path variability. What is path variability? What is the efficient path variability? And um, uh, how can you derive the complexity for final hypothetical space? And also. Can you determine by giving your uh, hypothetical space of your learning algorithm? Can you determine whether a concept class C is a uh, path learnable or efficient path learnable? What's the general strategy? Uh, if you if you if you finish your homework, of course, I I I, I bet you are familiar with those kind of uh, uh, problems, right? And then what's the basic dimension? And what is strategy? Okay. Can you? Uh, can verify uh, some uh, some kind of this space can shatter uh, two data points or four data points, five data points, right? And what where does VC dimension uh, how does VC dimension take effect in our um, pack learning results? Right? But don't worry, I won't ask you to remember the generation error bound which involves VC dimension. If you want you to Analyze. I will definitely, uh, definitely show the, show the uh, generation error bound. But you should know, giving you this bound, uh, you should be able to explain how this dimension takes effect, right? How this dimension connects to the Occam's Razor principle, right? And uh, then what is data dependent this dimension? That actually connects to the SVM, right? <coughs> how can we motivate the SVM? These are all about the. Uh, necessary uh, points you, you need to master in the computational learning theory. <coughs> and then we uh, spend a lot of time introduce, introducing the support back machines, right? From model formulation and implementation to kernel tricks and nonlinear SVM extension. For SVM, what is the learning principle? Can I use one word or two words to summarize the learning principle? Maximizing the margin, right? But the problem is that, although it's quite intuitive, the problem is that how do we justify the, max mar uh, the, 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 the margin maximization principle based on the computational learning theory results? Right? We spend, uh, we spend quite, a, uh, quite a few uh, time, to, to time to explain the connection. Right? It starts from the generation error bound, from the agnostic learning results. Right? And if we treat uh, all linear transfers beyond to the same huge space, then there's nothing to do. There's nothing to improve the bound. But if we can classify your linear transfer into many, many subfamilies, and we can identify which family our learned classifier linear transfer belong to, then we may optimize or further uh, tighten our generation error bound. Right? That's called data dependent DC dimension. Remember the connection. You need to memorize the connection. You should, you should be very clear about that. And then we uh, proceed to the hard SVM. Like, what is hard SVM? What's the basic assumption about hard, hard SVM? 
And what's the strict formulation of our max margin uh, learning principle? And then to simplify this problem, how can we restrict the parameter space? And why, after we uh, simplify the uh, parameter space, we still do not lose any optimal solutions. That was this problem of hard SMs. Hard SM essentially assumes the data is linearly separable, right? Of, of course, it's not very realistic. But how can we deal with non linear separable data? Then, then it comes out the soft SVM, right? So, soft SVM should enable some training examples to break into a margin to allow some misclassification, right? Then, how can we modify the hard SVM setting to obtain the soft SVM setting? What is the modification in the constraints? What are the modifications on objective functions? And here I want to emphasize you should be able to write down the definitions for both hard SVM and soft SVMs. I won't give you the I won't give you the explicit form. And how to implement soft SVM in a primal domain? Stochastic subgradient descent, right? Then what is the concept of the subgradient and sub derivatives? How can we calculate subgradient for um, SVM objective function? Remember, the hinge loss is a piecewise function, right? How can you calculate the subgradient for that? And how to implement your stochastic subgradient descent for SVM, right? How it is connected to the perception? It's a very interesting connection. It has a very interesting connection to perception. What is the underlying objective function of perception? Then we talk about uh, the dual form of SVM. We introduce how can we obtain a dual form for the general integrated constraint optimization problem. We explain why. Uh, we, we, we first explain why we can convert any such kind of optimization problem into a, an including min max optimization problem. But the strategy is even more general. So now, suppose I give you not only integrated constraints, also equated constraints, can also convert them into a, a equivalent minimax of position problem. It should be very easy. Then we look at detail of a dual form of SVM. What is dual form of soft SVM? How to solve the, this dual form step-by-step -step approach, right? And uh, how can we use the dual form solutions to obtain the primal solution, uh, solutions like, uh, uh, namely, the weak vector and bias parameter, right? So remember, to obtain the bias parameter, we have to use the, the KKD conditions. And then we talk about the support vectors. The support vectors come from the form of the B vector in terms of the dual solutions. Right? And uh, where, 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 uh, where are the support vectors located? Right? And how come, why, why, why should, why, why would we would like to, would we like to Claim that SM solution is sparse. And how can we use the dual form to make predictions? So here is an interesting question for you to consider. Like if you return to the simple case, only for hard SVM, then what is dual form for hard SVM? If you solve the dual form, how do you solve the dual form for hard SVM? Then what are the locations for the support vectors? And finally about the current trip. What is current trip? What's the motivation for kernel trade? And how can we justify a kernel is better kernel? Right? How can we construct how can we construct new kernels out of from existing kernels? And how can we plug in kernel trip into the SVM formulation such that we can make our SVM even more powerful? Then how can we implement our own nonlinear SVM? How can you use cross validation to select hyperparameters for SVM? Yeah, that's a pretty other things. Can you please afford the P solution for the Which one? Yeah, I'll ask the.